what I, I thought I would do tonight was talk a little bit in general about how I make a documentary film and then show you a 15 minute sequence from welfare as an illustration of the technique and then some sequences from basic training and Belfast, Maine as uh, an illustration of editing technique or, or uh, more refined editing. Since 1967, I've been doing a series of films which might, which might loosely be described as institution, a series of one after another. But I try to go to a place that, that's thought to be a good example of its kind and that has uh, specific geographical boundaries. And I, what I try to do is have a look at what's going on at that place. And the technique, uh, well, I hope it's been refined a bit over the years, is basically the same. The crew consists of me and two other people. No events are staged. I don't do any research to speak of before I start shooting, because I think the shooting of the film is the research. Over the course of anywhere from four to 12 weeks, I accumulate between 65 and 140 hours of film. I have no idea what the themes or the point of view are going to be until I'm well along in the editing of the film. The length of the final film has been anywhere from 73 minutes to six hours. I mean, the whole point uh, of making these films is to have fun, to have a little bit of an adventure, combined uh, intellectual, uh, emotional, and uh, sporting activities. The overall goal of these films is to be a series of Thematically, thematically related films that give an impressionistic account of uh, contemporary, uh, different aspects of contemporary American life. It's been relatively easy for me to get permission. Uh, only a couple of times it's taken very long. When I request permission, I try to make a full disclosure to describe the period of time of shooting, that nobody will be photographed who doesn't agree to be photographed, uh, or after give anybody a chance to review the sequence and see how it's used in the final film. Uh, that works I, uh, for me both e ethically and tactically because I think uh, ethically the important thing to do is to be straightforward with the people I'm dealing with and tactically it, it uh, gives people an impression which I hope is accurate that I'm being straightforward with. I think the worst thing you can do is uh, make up uh, cockamania stories about what you're going to do or the effect of what you're going to do. Originally, my innocence and naivete, when I first got started, I thought the documentary films would change something. Now, a cynical old man, and don't think they change anything. But I arrived at that decision before I was an old man, that I, my cynicism, I turned at uh, very young, or much younger than I am now. Uh, I once asked somebody for an illustration of, of uh, any uh, work in any field, documentary film, music, painting, poetry, novels, uh, that have changed anything. The best answer I got was that the marriage of Figaro had caused the French Revolution, which is something I am previously unaware of. <laughs> so sometimes somebody says, why do you make documentary films? If they're not going to change the world, and I, my answer to that is I do it because it's fun, it's interesting, and I'd be bored out of my mind if I what I'd like to do now is to show you the first 15 minutes of welfare and use that as an illustration to discuss uh, the technique and, and the way the films get made. I then visited a number of welfare centers in New York City and picked one on like, uh, 14th Street. I spent a day at the 14th Street Welfare Center before I started shooting, mainly to get a sense of the routine and meet some of the uh, heads of departments and some of the workers. I don't do much other research. I mean, sometimes for a film there'll be something written generally about the subject. Usually there's nothing written about the specific place that's the subject of the film. Sometimes I try to find a novel that deals with a a similar subject, for example, is a documentary novel by a Dutch writer named Jan de Hartog about a hospital in Houston, about the emergency work of a hospital in Houston, which I read before I did hospital. Uh, Kenneth Fearing wrote a novel called Hospital. But usually there's nothing much, for, or at least I'm not aware of much, to read. And it may be that I prefer not to seek 
uh, other people's opinions uh, because I'm vain enough to want to find out what I think. But that I spend I spend a day at this welfare center hanging around, and then a couple of weeks later I started uh, working on the board. The only thing I knew in advance was what took place in the various floors of the welfare center. So the issue. Every aspect of documentary filmmaking involves choice. In this case, it was the choice of the, uh, the subject matter, then the choice of where to shoot it, and then when you get physically at the place, what to shoot. And that's a matter, uh, to, speak, to talk about generally, of judgment, instinct, and luck. Uh, to some extent, I'm dependent on informants, in the best sense of the word of informant. Uh, the people at the place, the workers there, know much more about what's going on there than I do. So that I, I use the time when we're not shooting, uh, talking to people and making notes about what they tell me. They may say that uh, three to five on Friday afternoon is the busiest time. Or that there's a staff meeting uh, every Tuesday at, uh, at uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, one uh, welfare worker is tough and another one is uh, too kind. Or I shouldn't miss the computer room or whatever. I make notes about all that. I also uh, try to demystify the process of filmmaking. Uh, anytime somebody would say, that's a camera, isn't it? Or that's a tape recorder, to which I would sincerely reply, yes. And I said, would say, would you like to hear how the tape recorder works? Or would you like to look through the camera? And if, any, if people were interested, they could pick up the camera or put the headphones on and ask them to record. So I, try to make familiar the filmmaking process and not have it be threatening. Obviously, I don't do that with everybody, but uh, it's part of the effort to create an atmosphere where people are comfortable with the idea of what you're doing. So for example, uh, uh, of chance, I happened to see the couple just standing around waiting, and they, there was something about their look that, that interested me. So I began to follow them, and I followed them into that interview. Uh, you've just seen. I had no idea the interview was going to take place. I had no idea what either they or the welfare worker was going to say. It was, you know, chance and luck and, and oh, yeah, following my judgment, which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. And one of the reasons you have to shoot a lot of film in making these kind of movies is that your judgment isn't always good, or if, if something you start following doesn't turn out to be very interesting or you run out of film, or you run out of uh, tape. Like very occasionally somebody says no. I, I've learned over the course of the years to, to collect a lot of random shots because I know I'm going to need them in the edit. So over the course of a month at the Welfare Center, I think I forgot how many, but I accumulated maybe 90 hours of film. I, I had no idea what it meant to me. I mean, obviously, when you get a good sequence, like the happy couple or like the Indian, you know it's a good sequence. I, I have no idea at the time how I'm going to use it, or even uh, I think I'm going to use it. But often sequences that I uh, think are terrific when they're shot turn out to be, uh, end up uh, the proverbial editing room floor uh, because my initial enthusiasm wasn't supported by subsequent study of the sequence. So that uh, after I, in this case, in the case of welfare, I accumulated 100 hours of film. Then I went back to the editing room. I had to make up a log uh, indicating I had to have a summary of every shot. And so I make up a log book. And each sh each shot, uh, each roll of film runs for 11 and a half minutes. There can be one shot on a roll of film or 25 shots. Each shot is given a number. <coughs> In the log book, the number is entered at one sentence description of the sequence, print through numbers on the negative, which occur at every 20 frames, the edge code numbers, which occur every 16 frames, which allow you to edit the film and not lose synchronization, and the camera roll number and the sound roll number. And it's a big, big bookkeeping problem because with all that film, you want to be able to recover, you want to be able to find what you have and find it quickly. So when the log is done, then I look at all the sequences, uh, generally in the order in which they were shot. And I make notes. It's an initial evaluation. I, I make a selection 
I winnow down, say, the initial 90 hours, and then I begin to edit those sequences, which are candidate sequences for inclusion in the final film. And that takes me about seven or eight months. Uh, depending on the material I have, but it's usually about seven or eight months of increasingly intensive work, so that after maybe the second or third month, I find myself working six or seven days a week because I enjoy it. exercise, but experience, after you edit a few films, you know that they finally get made. You have the strength uh, or the insanity to keep sitting in the chair until the movie's over and you get intravenously fed. So at the end of seven or eight months, I have all the possible sequences that I might use in the final film. And then over a period of three or four days, I make the first assembly. The first assembly is usually about 30 or 40 minutes longer than the final film. And then it after I make that assembly, I winnow it down, and I particularly work on the rhythm uh, within the sequence, the internal rhythm of the sequence, and then the external rhythm, the relation, the, the, the shots that separate major sequences. And I try, and I work specifically on the dramatic structure of the film because I'm not making, I'm not trying to produce a document, I'm trying to produce a movie that has a dramatic structure. Well, I, I've got more ideas about the construction of the films from novels and plays and poems than I have from other movies. I mean, I think that's only a reflection of my uh, reading interest as opposed to my film. But I work very hard on the dramatic structure. Now, any given sequence, uh, for example, uh, the sequence with the uh, happy couple, that in real time was about 40 minutes. Uh, in film time, uh, as you saw it tonight, uh, it was maybe about six or seven minutes. Now, my job as a film editor with an individual sequence is to boil that sequence down into a usable form to make it appear as if it took place the way you're looking at it, even though it didn't take place that way. And even if I show you the whole 40 minutes or sequence as it was originally shot, it would be different than the way you would have seen and heard it had you been present, because the difference between the camera and the eye. Uh, the eye doesn't have the opportunity for close-ups. So. During the shooting, I have to be sure that I collect enough material so that I will be able to reduce the sequence or compress it or condense it to some kind of usable form. Get shots that allow you to condense the sequence in the course of the editing. For example, if a meeting is going on, or and you're following the talk at the meeting, sometimes the talk isn't interesting or you think it's not interesting, so you no longer shoot the speakers. You should take shots of the people sitting around the table so that you can use those shots to cut in at a later time when you're trying to jump from the 15th minute of the sequence to the 45th minute of the sequence and make it appear as if there was no time in between uh, 15 and 45 minutes. There's the initial work, which takes a long period of time, of condensing the individual sequences that might make it into the final film. And then, when I've done that, as a result of doing that, I think I know the sequences very well. Now, I've had a few thoughts about the structure, both in the course of the shooting, all, but as a result, I mean, the editing is like to uh, writing a book or going to the library and writing a PhD thesis, where the rushes are your notes, and then you, uh, you come back from your research in the field or in the library or both, with uh, six shoe cartons full of notes that you have to turn into a book. You, you, obviously, you have to do the technical aspects of filmmaking. You have to have a good picture, you have to have good sound, or you take this good picture and good sound, although not everybody will agree with that. Uh, but that's only the beginning. And, and perhaps the most demanding and most interesting part of making these movies is figuring out what we've got. What do these sequences mean? What do these rushes mean? And that, for me, that's the, the great fascination of making these movies, because I have the privilege of studying different aspects of human beings and trying to figure out what's going on. 
so that my, my job is initially to identify to myself what I think is going on. And every aspect of documentary filmmaking is an example of choice and noticing. And it, it, part of the fun, part of the interest, is the degree to which you try to be conscious of what's going on around you, and specifically what's going on in the film, uh, which are your notes about the experience you had during the time you were at the place. Now, I've got, I've got this great block of material. How am I going to organize it? But the first thing I have to do is think of a title. Okay, so in this case, I call it welfare. One of the choices involved in the title, apart from the words that I use, is what kind of type I use. In this case, I pick a very elegant type as a contrast to the situations that were going to be shown in the film. You know, what, what is the reason that I began the film the way I did with the ID photographs? You see a, a diverse group of people. You see men, you see women, you see Asians, you see African Americans, you see people who might be Hispanic, you see people with different kinds of dress, different kinds of attitude toward being photographed. One of the things I wanted to do in starting the movie the way I did was to play against the cliche that uh, most of the people on welfare were Hispanic or, uh, or Afro-American. So I showed the melting pot of people from all different backgrounds. In addition to that, I wanted to show that welfare demanded uh, people have to have IDs. Now, some people, when they see that sequence, they say, oh, it's uh, dehumanizing the person to have their picture taken. But the reason to protect the welfare recipients so they can cash their check and so no, nobody else can take, take their money. But I have to try and, and speculate for my own purposes in order to make the choice as to whether or not I'm going to use that shot and what I think the shot suggests. And then I wanted to introduce the idea of how they treated the welfare center. There's an effort in the welfare center to protect people's privacy by assigning, uh, by giving them a number rather than using their name. So I use, so I have the main title, the photography sequence, and then those two sequences serve as a kind of prologue to introduce some of the, what I consider to be the major ideas of the film. And then, and only then, you see the shot on the outside of the building on, a, on 14th Street. And that's the only time you're outside for the entire film. Okay. And then there's the sequence in the lobby. Now, I use the sequence in the lobby, one, to show how crowded it is, and how many people there are in the well, uh, waiting around uh, their turn. And, uh, it's one of the things that one of the common complaints about welfare is you have to wait. Nobody during that film refused to be photographed. It happened all the time. Naturally, I'm pleased because right. it makes it much easier. And also, because I, I don't think I have any right to force. I mean, can't be Why people agree to be photographed, I can only speculate about. It's also people like the idea of being photographed. They also like the idea that you're sufficiently interested in them to want to take their picture. Well, seven or eight years ago, I did a movie about a shelter for battered women in camp. And I, I was very fearful that the women, you know, the women got to participate. Much to my amazement, there wasn't one woman at the shelter in the eight weeks that I was there uh, who refused to be photographed. And I finally got my courage up toward the end of the shoot to ask them why they agreed. And they said because they wanted to share their experience with other people in the hope that it might help other women seeing uh, what they had been through might uh, more readily turn to help or seek help, which was extraordinarily generous of them, particularly given some of the stories that you heard from them about their lives, uh, being burned by cigarettes, being shot at, by being strangled, uh, 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 forced out of the house naked, forced to being trying to run one of them down in the car. I mean, any horrible, practically any horrible thing you can think of that happened to these women, and they talked about it in the film.
I mean, there are some subjects that uh, are not amenable to this kind of technique. The things that work best are either funny or emotional. I mean, they have to be readily understandable. For example, I did a film on a state legislature, and I, from, from my point of view, that was right at the border of what's possible with this technique, because it was very dependent on talk, and a lot of it was dependent on technical talk, uh, even though it was political. And uh, if you're interested in politics and, and the way decisions are made by a legislature, you might be interested in film. But if you're looking for an action film, state legislature is not it. Uh, not your cup of tea. On the other hand, I just made a film about a ballet company where there's hardly any dialogue at all, and everything is expressed through, through action. I, I have a problem with the question, because I don't know who Jerry Springer is. One of my goals is to, to have as wide a variety of human behavior in the films as possible. For example, I mean, I, in all my films, uh, Films. I, I hope there you you see uh, good examples of human behavior, as well as examples of banal or different or cruel behavior. Well, first of all, I don't I don't think I control you as a viewer because I have no idea what your experience is or your interests are or anything like that. I I, I don't know how to think about the audience. I mean, the only way I think about the audience is they're as smart or as dumb as I am. Because I think anything else is condescending. Because I mean, how would I know in 1973 that I was going to show an excerpt from this movie from Welfare at DePaul University in whatever this is, 2009, <laughs> that film editing is talking to yourself. And I find that very interesting. You, even if you shot with 360 cameras from 360 angles, that still represents a choice. Uh, what, what I the word that I substitute for objectivity, and it's, I hope it's more than a substitution, is fairness. Uh, when I reduce the sequence from 45 minutes to 6 minutes, I, I feel I have an obligation to be fair to the participants. The participants have a chance to say no either before, during, or immediately after the sequence. Oh, the institution, no. Yeah. I show it to the institution maybe a week before it's on television. Oh. Um, sometimes the night before. I haven't had any trouble with, well, I had trouble with Titty Cut Falling, which is the first one I made. Uh, but that was, that's a long story, and that was basically political. Two other films, Primate and High School, when the people in the institution saw, first saw the film, they liked it. I mean, I, I was present when they saw it, they told me they liked it. Excuse me, when they read the reviews and didn't like the way they were characterized in print, they turned against the film. For instance, the principal of the high school really liked high school when she saw it. When an article appeared in a newspaper saying that I had made a middle class debunking film, a horrible accusation, she turned against the film. The students at Northeast High, where high school was made, on the other hand, wore t shirts saying that Fred Wiseman was right. And much as I was flattered by that, none of them had seen the film. No, uh, I still, still, films are still shot on film. I like black and white. I don't know how many of my first 12 or 13 films were all in black and white. But then, yeah, I made The Store, which is the movie about the Neiman Marcus main store in Dallas. And I switched to color because I wanted to show the color of the merchandise. With the exception of Near Death, uh, all of them have been in color, in, despite the fact that I like black and white, in part because there were more advances in color negative, and you could shoot with better quality in low light situations. For example, I wanted to do ballet uh, in 1992 in black and white. And we shot the first day in one of the rehearsal studios at the American Ballet Theater in black and white, and sent it to the lab in New York, and got it back the next day, and it was unusable. And, and shot the next day in color in the same uh, rehearsal room, and it was fine, because the, uh, the color negative was so much faster. Uh, so since then, I've, I've uh, because 
part because I switched, in part because I, I, there were always a lot of low-light situations. I've stayed with color, but my so-called aesthetic preference is always for black and white. I direct and I do the sound and I work with the cameraman. The cameraman, and there's a third person that changes the magazines. We usually have three mags, and one mag usually has, say, outdoor stock in case we have to go outdoors with the other two. Uh, uh, and we have little signals between us. We, we, we look at each other, and, and, I, and I lead him with the mic. It's exactly the same issues that you have in writing a novel or, or a play. There are issues of character development, of foreshadowing, of passage of time. I try to be conscious of that. Two of the best books I ever read about filming are UNESCO's essays about playwriting, a recent book by James Wood uh, about fiction writing. Because the issues are, for me, exactly the same. A filmmaker is limited, it's much more circumscribed, although not really circumscribed, by what you have in the Russians. But within the context of what's available in the Russians, you have a very wide choice. You know, there are thousands of ways you could organize 100 hours of material. I think I've learned more from thinking about what writers do than what other people do. Within a sequence, I, I feel that I have to be faithful to chronology. Even though I'm reducing a sequence from 45 minutes to six minutes, uh, I, I, I still feel within that six minutes, the events that I use have to be in the order that they occurred in. On the other hand, I don't feel at all any need to be faithful to chronology in terms of starting the film with something that was shot on the 30th day and ending with something that was on the first day. I, I, I simply don't like that. It calls too much attention to the filmmaking. And the whole, one of the basis of the technique is to not call attention to the filmmaking, but to the material. And if the, the irony and the comedy has to emerge from the situation, not because we're being wise guys. Because otherwise, it's contemptuous. And it, if there's genuine irony or comedy in the situation, it will emerge. And if you force it, you just make a fool of you. You, the filmmaker, make a fool of yourself. There are only about eight or nine sources of money for the these kind of films. Like a couple of foundations, uh, used to be the MacArthur Foundation, all of them sort of temporarily out of the documentary uh, financing business. MacArthur, Ford, National Endowment of the Arts, occasionally National Endowment of the Humanities, if you are up to writing a PhD thesis uh, for a proposal. And uh, the Diamond Foundation used to give some money. Uh, and then occasionally I've got, entered a co-production deal with BBC, <coughs> or art in France. And that's about it. I don't take private investment because it is, I, I can't in good conscience take other people's money on the idea they're gonna make money because they won't. So those are the sources for each film. So far, uh, I'm able to raise the money from some combination. Of them. The, the last letter is taken from a chapter of a great Russian novel by Vasily Gross. I mean, I think it's one of the great, great novels of our time. It, the novel is 800 pages, and it's Russia from the Revolution through the Battle of Stalingrad. I took one chapter, 14 page chapter, and initially did it as a play in France. And then the, the play was well received, so I was able to get the money to make a movie based on the same text, although the movie was not a shooting of a play. When, when a documentary film works, or when this style of film works, it works, you, you feel you're there. And when it works, there's a, there's a sense of immediacy about it, a sense of presence that is more direct than words, because words are a recreation. A piece of paper took place, and, and if somebody's a really good writer, it can be better than a movie.
make any general statement that one is better than the other. It really depends on the, how well it's done. I, mean, I chose to make films, but the hard dive description of what goes on in the emergency war or, or uh, Kenneth Fearing uh, uh, in his novel or Thomas Mann in The Magic Mountain, uh, uh, you, uh, you all get a sense of what can go on in, in, a, in a hospital. I'll, I'll give you a sense. Uh, I started to do the movie that became Law and Order in Los Angeles with the Los Angeles Police Department, but was uh, told after a week that I could shoot anything. I couldn't ride around in police cars, but I could shoot anything else. And since there were no foot patrols, I really limited the story. <laughs> Finishing this movie about the Paris Opera Ballet, and then uh, I'll tell you another one in the summer. The shortest period of the shooting has been a month, and the longest has been 12 weeks. And with one exception, and that exception being the movie I did at the Comedy Francaise, uh, where I spent three months there before I started, not because I wanted to do research, but because I had to get commission from 23 unions. Hung out there every day, talked to the union members until I voted to give a commission. Well, I haven't been paid. That's the only time I've spent any length of time in a place before I started shooting. I really don't know what my so-called story is until the final stages of the editing. I'm not very good at editing in the abstract or in, in thinking about the material in the abstract. The story really emerges <coughs> from intensive study of the material and then seeing how it fits together and trying to create what I call a dramatic structure to the editing. I, I keep notes of what I have during the shooting and at, at some point I make an assessment uh, of whether I think I have enough. I used an electronic slate for a mic tap. More recently, uh, time code. There's, there's a, internal clock in the camera and the tape recorder and it puts the time on the, the tape and on the film uh, so when you come to sync it up uh, you just match the time codes. Uh, <laughs> it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> The garden, well, the garden I, I was able to make, but I haven't been able to release it. It's a film about uh, Madison Square Garden. I got into a disagreement with the garden, uh, and, which has now been resolved, but uh, there's still uh, some uh, music rights issues that haven't been resolved, so I haven't released it. Take a walk. <laughs> no, and, and sometimes, you know, at the end of the year, you're stuck, you leave it, and, and, and you have a good night's sleep, and you come back to the end of the next morning and you find a solution. I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, I, part of the fun of doing these movies is finding out how the mind works. Because you, you keep, I mean, uh, it's proof of the existence of the unconscious. Because I find that I'm constantly working on the film, even though I'm not working on it. And the old cliches about thinking about something you were in the shower or dreaming, dreaming about it, have all, I've experienced all that. And I, you know, I, I've left the editing room in great frustration, and the next morning come back and in two minutes found what I thought was a solution to an insoluble problem. Whether it was a good solution or not, I don't know, but it was a solution. When I'm making a film about a public institution, by that I mean an institution supported by public funds, by taxpayers' money, I really don't need to get permission or releases because there are a number of Supreme Court decisions that say that public institutions are meant to be transparent and what goes on in them is news, even though it may not appear on television the next day. Uh, but for most of the films, while I do get permission, I technically don't need them if it's a public, if it's a publicly supported institution. If it's a small place, I can put up a notice that I'm sure everybody will see. Uh, at, 
at Northeast High in Philadelphia, for example, or at uh, Central Park East, where I did high school too, uh, I asked the principal to send home a notice to all the parents uh, that a film was being made. And if they didn't want their child to be in the film, they should notify the school. Nobody did that. But everybody was notified. Uh, a lot of these institutions have internal uh, newspapers or bulletins. I always, if they do, I always make sure there's an article in the bulletin announcing the <coughs> film, uh, saying how the film's going to be made and where it's going to be shown. So it, it, it eases the, the more people know about the film and how it's being made and where it's going to be used, uh, the easier it is to, to work because the less likelihood is there there is that somebody is going to say, what are you doing? I didn't show it in Philadelphia for a long time because the doctor who, or the uh, gynecologist who gives a sex lecture to the boys was upset about the film. And it, the high school immediately followed Tiddy McFarley's where there was a long trial and a vast amount of money spent on lawyers. So I voluntarily didn't show it within a 50, 50 mile radius of Philadelphia for a number of years. If I simply wanted to avoid it, I think I would have won, but it would have been $250,000 later. And that's still more than I make in a week. Well, they're, they're now all available uh, on the internet. Okay. Some support films. They worked for a long time because no DVD distributor was interested in putting them out or maybe made me an offer that, that I could accept. So I decided to put them all out myself, and that's worked out extremely well, because there are no intermediaries, and it's been relatively simple to do. And, and while I'm not very familiar with the internet or the notion of what constitutes a virus, I found that once they came out, <coughs> people, I mean, without my having to spend money advertising, the word got out that they were out, and, and people are ordering. What interests me is, is being able to continue to work and going from one movie to another. So I can't think of a way I prefer a better way to spend my time. It certainly relieves the boredom. One of the reasons it's interesting is that, that, is that it's very demanding. It's demanding physically because it's a sport. You have to stay in shape. You have to run around with heavy equipment. You put in long days. Uh, in order, I mean, some films I train for. I mean, I always try to stay in shape, but some, sometimes when I know it's going to be very physically demanding, I, I you know, I train even more. Uh, I try to even put in more time getting ready. And, it, and it's intellectually extremely demanding, because each year I have to try and, I, I, for each film, I have to, I, I, I have to think in a, about a different subject. I have to learn about a subject, and I have to think about how I can present it in film terms, how I can find a dramatic structure. It's, and it's also emotionally demanding, uh, not only in terms of the time you have to put in, but also sometimes because of the material. For example, uh, 20 years or so ago, I did a film about people dying, or how decisions were made to, to uh, let people die. And so I spent six weeks in a medical intensive care unit. And while working on a film, is a, sometimes a defense against what you're seeing and hearing, was emotionally extremely demanding every day to, to be in rooms with people who were near death. Thank you, Ray. with 360 cameras and 360 angles, that still represents a choice. Uh, what, what I, the word that I substitute for objectivity, and I hope it's more than a substitution, is fairness. Uh, when I reduce a sequence from 45 minutes to six minutes, I, I feel I have an obligation to be fair to the participants. The participants 
have a chance to say no either before, during, or immediately after the sequence. Oh, the institution, no. Yeah. I show it to the institution maybe a week before it's on television. Oh. Um, <laughs> sometimes the night before. I haven't had any trouble with, well, I had trouble with Titty Catholic, which is the first one I made. Uh, but that was, that's a long story, and that was basically political. Two other films, Primate and High School, when the people in the institution saw, first saw the film, they liked it. I mean, I, I was present when they saw it, and they told me they liked it. Excuse me, when they read the reviews <laughs> and didn't like the way they were characterized in print, <laughs> they turned against the film. For instance, the principal of the high school really liked high school when she saw it, when an article appeared in the newspaper saying that I had made a middle class debunking film, a horrible accusation, she turned against the film. <laughs> the students at Northeast High, where high school was made, on the other hand, wore t-shirts saying that Fred Wiseman was right, and much as I was flattered by that, none of them had seen the film. No, uh, I still, still, films are still shot on film. I like black and white. I like that. Many of my first 12 or 13 films were all in black and white. But then yeah, I made The Store, which is a movie about the Neiman Marcus main store in Dallas. And I switched to color because I wanted to show the color of the merchandise. With the exception of Near Death, uh, all the films have been in color, in, despite the fact that I like black and white, <coughs> in part because there were more advances in color negative and you could shoot with better quality in low light situations. For example, I wanted to do ballet uh, in 1992 in black and white, and we shot the first day in one of the rehearsal studios at the American Ballet Theater in black and white, and sent it to the lab in New York, and got it back the next day, and it was unusable. And, and shot the next day in color in the same uh, rehearsal room, and it was fine because the, uh, the color negative was so much faster. Uh, so since then, I've, I've, uh, because, in part because I switched, in part because I, uh, there were always a lot of low light situations, I've stayed with color. But my so-called aesthetic preference is always for black and white. I direct and I do the sound and I work with the cameraman. The cameraman, and there's a third person that changes the magazine. We usually have three mags, and one mag usually has, say, outdoor stock in case we have to go outdoors with the other two. Uh, and we have little signals between us. We're, we, we look at each other, and, and, I, and I lead him with the mic. It's exactly the same issues that you have in writing a novel or, or a play. There are issues of character development or foreshadowing and passage of time. I try to be conscious of that. Two of the best books I've ever read about filming are UNESCO's essays about playwriting, a recent book by James Wood uh, about fiction writing. Because the issues are, for me, exactly the same. A filmmaker is limited, it's much more circumscribed, although not really circumscribed by what you have in the Russians. But within the context of what's available in the Russians, you have a very wide choice. There are thousands of ways you could organize 100 hours of material. I think I've learned more from thinking about what writers do than what other people do. Within a sequence, I, I feel that I have to be faithful to chronology. Even though I'm reducing a sequence from 45 minutes to six minutes, uh, I, I, I still feel within that six minutes, the events that I use have to be in the order that they occurred in. On the other hand, I don't feel at all any need to be faithful to chronology in terms of starting the film with something that was shot on the 30th day and ending with something that was on the first day. I, I, I simply don't like that. It calls too much attention to the filmmaking 
and the whole one of the basis of the technique is to not call attention to the filmmaking, but to the material. And if the, the irony and the comedy has to emerge from the situation, not because we're being wise guys. Because otherwise, it's contemptuous. And it, if there's genuine irony or comedy in the situation, it will emerge. And if you force it, you just like a fool of you. You, the filmmaker, make a fool of yourself. There are only about eight or nine sources of money for the, these kind of films. Like a couple of foundations, uh, used to be the MacArthur Foundation, all of them sort of temporarily out of the documentary uh, financing business. MacArthur, Ford, National Endowment of the Arts, occasionally National Endowment of the Humanities, if you are up to writing a PhD thesis uh, for a proposal. And uh, the Diamond Foundation used to give some money. Uh, and then occasionally I've got entered a co-production deal with BBC or Arte in France. And that's about it. I don't take private investment because it is, I, I can't in good conscience take other people's money on the idea they're going to make money because they won't. So those are the sources. For each film, so far, uh, I'm able to raise the money from some combination. The, the last letter is taken from a chapter of a great Russian novel by Vasily Grossman. I mean, I think it's one of the great, great novels of our time. And the novel is 800 pages, and it's Russia from the Revolution through the Battle of Stalingrad. I took one chapter, 14-page chapter, and initially did it as a play in France. And then the, the play was well received, so I was able to get the money to make a movie based on the same text, although the movie was not a shooting of a play. I think when when documentary film works, or when this style of film works, it works, you, you feel you're there. And when it works, there's a, there's a sense of immediacy about it, a sense of presence that is more direct than words, because words are a recreation. A piece of paper took place, and, and if somebody's a really good writer, it could be better than a movie. Make any general statement that one is better than the other, it really depends on the, how well it's done. I, I chose to make films, but the hard dive description of what goes on in the emergency ward or, or uh, Kenneth Fearing uh, uh, in his novel or Thomas Mann in The Magic Mountain, uh, uh, you, uh, you all get a sense of what can go on in, in, a, in a hospital. I'll, I'll give you a sense. Uh, I started to do the movie that became Law and Order in Los Angeles with the Los Angeles Police Department, but was uh, told after a week that I could shoot anything. I couldn't ride around in the police cars, but I could shoot anything else. And since there were no foot patrols, I really limited the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm just finishing this movie about the Paris Opera Ballet. Uh, and I'll play you another one in the summer. The shortest period of the shooting has been a month, and the longest has been 12 weeks. And with one exception, and that exception being the movie I did at the Comedy Francaise, uh, where I spent three months there before I started, not because I wanted to do research, but because I had to get permission from 23 unions. I hung out there every day, talked to the union members until they voted to give me permission. Well, by having to pay. <coughs> That's the only time I've spent any length of time in a place before I started shooting. I really don't know what my so-called story is until mm -hmm. the final stages of the editing. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at editing in the abstract or in, in thinking about the material in the abstract. The story really emerges <coughs> from intensive study of the material and then seeing how it fits together and trying to create what I call a dramatic structure to the editing. I, I keep notes of what I have during the shooting and at, at some point I make an assessment uh, of where I think I have enough. I use an electronic slate for a mic tap. <coughs> More recently, uh, time code. There's, there's a, internal clock in the camera and in the tape recorder and it puts the time on the, the tape and on the film 
uh, so when you come to sync it up, uh, you just match the time codes.
what interests me is, is being able to continue to work and going from one movie to another. Because I can't think of a way I prefer a better way to spend my time. It certainly relieves the boredom. And one of the reasons it's interesting is that, that it's in very demanding. It's demanding physically because it's a sport. You have to stay in shape, you have to run around with heavy equipment, you put in long days. Uh, and or, I mean, some films I train for. I mean, I always try to stay in shape, but some, sometimes when I know it's going to be very physically demanding, I, I you know, I train even more. Uh, I try even put in more time getting ready. And, and it's intellectually extremely demanding because each year I have to try and, for each film, I have to, I, I, I have to think in a, about a different subject. I have to learn about a subject and I have to think about how I can present it in film terms, how I can find a dramatic structure. It's, and it's also emotionally demanding, uh, not only in terms of the time you have to put in, but also sometimes because of the material. For example, uh, 20 years or so ago, I did a film about people dying, how decisions were made to, to uh, let people die. And so I spent six weeks in their medical intensive care unit. And while working on a film, is a, sometimes a defense against what you're seeing and hearing, it was emotionally extremely demanding every day to, to be in rooms with people who were near death. 